Thank you, buddy. Thank you very much. By a show of hands, how many of you are here today? <laughs> That's encouraging. I'm going to be talking about the epidemic of apostasy, and I want to begin by thanking Lamb and Lion Ministries and David Reagan in particular. What a ministry is going on here, don't you think? Wonderful ministry. You know, I want to tell you a story about uh, a young couple, and they went to a movie one day in the middle of the day, and as they drove off, there was somebody watching the house. And he goes around to the back of the house, and he breaks the window, and he's crawling in the back window, and then he hears this voice from a parrot saying, I see you, and Jesus sees you. <laughs> well, it didn't bother the man, so he kept on breaking his way in, and he's two-thirds of the way in, and the parrot says, I see you, and Jesus sees you. Well, finally, he's all the way in there, and the uh, you know, guy stands up, and he brushes all the glass off himself, and the parrot says, I see you, and Jesus sees you. Attack, Jesus, and this Doberman pincher. <laughs> this Doberman pincher named Jesus mauls the guy, and he guy dies out the window. Nobody's ever seen him again. Now that's a different Jesus. <laughs> but I would like to suggest to you that that Jesus is not as bad as the Jesus of apostasy. You see, I say that because you can heal from a dog bite. But if you believe in a counterfeit Jesus who preaches a counterfeit gospel, you've got a counterfeit salvation. It comes down to that just as easy as can be. And that's why these kinds of conferences are so important. Now, my friends, apostasy is a rich word in the Greek. It carries the idea of a departure or a falling away, a forsaking of the truth, a defection from the truth, a revolt from the truth, and a swerving away from the truth. Now I must pause for a moment and say that this is the after lunch session. You see, there's gonna be a tendency for there to be a departure from consciousness. <laughs> There's going to be a tendency to have a falling away from a waking state. You see, but see, what you want to be careful about is these cameras. You see, if those cameras catch you asleep, you're on TV. Everybody knows it, so don't fall asleep. Now listen, the signs of the time are so critically important. They are prophetic events that uh, point towards the end times. That lets us know that we're living in the season of the Lord's return. You might consider it to be intel in advance. Uh, powerful nations have intelligence agencies like the CIA. And you know, the Bible provides us with God's intel in advance, and he does this with signs. And the signs of the times are multiple. Now, David Reagan gave, gave us a very helpful categorization yesterday. I've got a slightly different categorization, including Israel, and then technical signs, which we heard about a while ago from Nathan, and then national signs, like all the nations building up to, uh, you know, gang up on Israel, the Muslim nations, and Russia. You've got religious and moral signs, some of which I'm going to talk about today as related to apostasy, and then you've got earth and sky signs, cosmic phenomena. And so I'm not going to touch on all of that today, but I am going to say that apostasy fits into the larger picture of the signs of our times. You see, it would be significant if just one of these signs was coming to pass. More significant still if two of these signs were coming to the pass. But the fact is, is we've got multiple prophetic signs today that are converging in our day. It's what I call the convergence factor. And that leads us to believe that we are indeed living in the season of the Lord's return. Now here's the thing. We need to be thoughtful observers of the times. Do you remember the ancient Jews? The ancient Jews should have recognized that Jesus was the divine Messiah. You see, back in Isaiah, we are told that when the Messiah comes on the scene, the blind will see and the deaf will hear and the lame will walk. Well, what happened when Jesus came on the scene? Well, the blind could see and the deaf could hear and so forth. So the Jewish leaders should have been able to see the signs of the times, but they were blind to it. They could tell the weather was going bad by looking at the sky, but they couldn't discern the signs of the times. Now, we, we should not make the same mistake. 
There are many signs of the times pointing toward the second coming of Christ and the events that lead up to the rapture. And what we want to do is to make sure that we're not ignorant of those. We want to understand what the Bible says about the signs that lead up to the rapture so that we're prepared. And that's what this study is all about. Now, I want to be careful here because no one knows the day or the hour. Christ himself told us that. No one knows the day or the hour, but we can know the general season of the Lord's return. Now, my friends, I do insist that we take a biblical approach. Is that okay with you? I've seen a lot of very sensational things about the signs of the times where they read things into the Bible that aren't there. We must take a biblical approach on all of this. Kind of reminded of that second grade girl who came home from Sunday school one day, and she was so excited about what she learned. And so Daddy said to her, well, what did you learn in Sunday school? And so the little girl said, oh, Daddy, it was just so great because, you see, God created Adam first. And then God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. So God put Adam to sleep and took out his brains and made a woman of them. (laughs) And all the women said, (laughs) Nah, that's not in the Bible. That's in Second Illusions 3. We must be biblical. And toward that end, I do want to let you know there are some biblical resources back on the book tables, not just my book table, but all the ministries that are represented here. And these books are engineered to help you to understand Bible prophecy better. They all deal with different topics related to biblical prophecy. Some of them are reference works. Uh, My more recent books include The End Times in Chronological Order, which takes us from today all the way into heaven. If you want to know what's going to happen between 2013 and heaven in chronological order, then this book will help you. And then 40 Days Through Revelation is a very devotional, inspirational, uplifting treatment of the book of Revelation in 40 days. And you don't have to do it in 40 days if you don't want. You can skip every other day and do it in 80 days if you want to. <laughs> but these are designed to bring uh, you know, the joy of the Lord to you to uplift you in spirit, because the more excited you are about Bible prophecy, uh, the better your spiritual life's gonna be. You know, that's an eternal perspective, amen? Amen. So then, let's hop right into it. My goal today, briefly, will be fourfold. I wanna talk about the biblical basis for end times apostasy. Secondly, I wanna give you specific examples of apostasy in our day. And then third, I wanna look at statistics that reveal the severity of the problem. And then I wanna close briefly with an exhortation. So let's just hop right in. Uh, Let's talk about false prophets first. In every age, there have been false prophets. Isn't that a great picture? That says it all. Took me two hours to get that wolf to wear that thing. Yeah. (laughs) Don't normally go to that trouble, but for David Reagan, I'd do anything, okay? (laughs) Hope you appreciate that, my, my friend. Now, false prophets look good, but they're deadly. That's what we see on a lot of TV shows today. That's why I'm glad that uh, Lamb and Lion produces a TV show you can actually trust, you see. But there's a lot of shows out there where you channel surf you can't trust because there's a lot of false prophecy out there. And as well, uh, this says it all, beware of false prophets. You see all those snails (laughs) bowing before a tape dispenser? (coughs) That's a false prophet. Spiritual deception is in every age. According to 2 Corinthians 11.4, we are warned about uh, those who preach another Jesus and a different spirit and a different gospel. But you see, Scripture gets more specific. It's not just general warnings we want to deal with. We want to look at the specific prophecies that deal with last days apostasy. And uh, we begin with 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self and lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Now, my friend David Reagan is exactly right. What we see in this passage, among other things, is humanism, materialism, and hedonism. Lovers of self is humanism. Lovers of money is materialism. And lovers of pleasure is hedonism. And I might mention to you that materialism and hedonism are both part of the humanistic worldview. 
Now here's the danger. It's not just adults I'm worried about. I'm worried about our kids. You see, the public school systems have become bastions of humanism. They are religious institutions now teaching the false religion of humanism to our children. This is the kind of garbage that a lot of kids are picking up in their schools. And there's also going to be religion without power. And I think that we see that today. There will be the appearance of godliness but denying its power. But you know what? These are counterfeits. Some of these counterfeits might make you feel good as a human and build you up as a human using psychology and other things. But the fact is there's no spiritual power that is there. Kind of reminds me of Jeremiah 2.23. Back in the Old Testament, God told his people, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, they forsook God, but they also came up with counterfeit spiritualities, substitute spiritualities. Now, do we, do we see that today? I think that we do. We see people coming up with their own substitute spiritualities, and it shouldn't be. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 5 tells us this. The time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And I like this graphic. Uh, Sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to your soul. You know, this next weekend, I can promise you there's going to be a lot of sugar across this nation on Sunday morning. All across this nation, there's going to be sugar-coated preaching. We need a return to the Word of God. Just to give you a couple of examples of not enduring in the truth, Scripture says that there will be denials of God in the end time, 2 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5. Denials of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Denials of Christ's return, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Denials of the faith, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Denials of sound doctrine, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. Denials of morals, we've got a moral crisis, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 8. And denials of authority, you know, especially among our young, 2 Timothy 3, 4. Now, in sum, this is what we're going to see in the end times according to this brief survey of Scripture. There's going to be false prophets that seem like true prophets, False gospels contrary to the biblical gospel. False concepts of Jesus Christ. Substitute spiritualities. A departure from sound teaching. The embracing of religious myths. A form of godliness without true spiritual power. Humanism, materialism, and hedonism. And that's bad news. That is bad news. And that's what we're going to focus on. I'm going to give you some actual examples. But let me just emphasize that this description of this kind of apostasy taken in conjunction with the other signs of the times adds emphasis to the fact that the day is drawing near. We're not far away, I don't believe. Professor at Dallas Seminary, where I attended, put it this way, those of us who, fo- uh, those of us who will follow Christ and his word as opposed to the rising emphasis upon religious experience will increasingly become a smaller group until one day Uh, We will be on the outside of the American evangelical church looking in. This is what we are en route to as I speak. Now, I want to give you a sampling of the evidence. And I say sampling on purpose because if I was going to give you a full exposition, we would be here till midnight. Now, David Reagan has not given me till midnight. So I'm going to be quick and I'm going to summarize some of the big points. And let's begin with the Bible. You see, foundational Uh, foundationally there's been an undermining of the Bible began with the higher criticism that came into this country in the late 1800s and early 1900s and at that time uh, basically enlightenment thought was applied to the Bible and inspiration and the inerrancy of scripture were rejected out of hand scripture writers were considered mere editors that spliced together earlier man-made documents and basically the Bible was not viewed as the word of God but rather was the, the word of man And by the way, the miracles were deemed a myth. It's like they took scissors and started to just cut those miracles right out of the Bible. Fast forward to today, Bart Ehrman, a a, uh, person who studied at Moody and Wheaton. Then he went to Princeton and got all messed up. But he says that the New Testament manuscripts have many mistakes. This is a guy that went to Moody and to Wheaton. Human fingerprints are all over the Bible, he says. 
The idea of an inerrant Bible is denied. It gets worse. Here's the Jesus Seminar. I'm looking at John Dominic Croissant, and I don't just read their books, I go to hear him in person. I've actually sat under his lectures and, and listened to what he had to say. And he, among others at the Jesus Seminar, say that the New Testament is unreliable. And of the many statements in the Gospels attributed to Jesus, only 18% were likely uttered by him. Jesus didn't say the majority of what the New Testament said he said, and nearly all of Jesus' sayings in John's Gospel are judged inauthentic. He didn't say those things. Even Christian theologians are combating the Bible now. There's a book written and published just last year by my friend Norman Geisler. It's called Defending Inerrancy. And in this book, sadly, he documents a number of evangelical scholars who are publishing books that undermine the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. My friends, it should not be. It should not be, but it is happening. The Bible bashers are now within the gate. Now here's the thing. Once the Bible is undermined, the domino effect occurs. You see, all the other doctrines begin to fall. After the Bible is undermined, that means all other doctrines of the Bible are undermined. For example, today, there are some Christians who are saying that God is not all-powerful and all-knowing. That explains the power or the problem of evil. You see, evil is so bad in our world that we must conclude that God is a good God, but he's just not strong enough to bring about a good world. So God is not all-powerful. In terms of salvation, lots of Christians today are now claiming that Jesus might not be the only way. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Jesus, well, some Christians are saying that Jesus was not perfect, that he made mistakes while he was on this earth. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that we're seeing penetrate the church. Here's a man you've seen in the news. His name is Jerry DeWitt. He's been in almost every newspaper in the country. He was a pastor in the Bible Belt, and the problem of evil disturbed him, and so he came to believe that there is no God. That is apostasy. He joined up with a group that has become very popular online called the Clergy Project, and based on their website, we read that it is a confidential online community for active and former clergy who do not hold supernatural beliefs. It helps members move beyond their former faith, and it also helps them to come out, aiding them in how to tell their families that they no longer believe. Another very popular website is Recovering from Religion. On their website, we read, <clears throat> if you are one of the many people who have determined that religion no longer has a place in their life, but are still dealing with the after effects in some way or another, recovering from religion may be just the right spot for you. The primary focus of recovering from religion is to provide ongoing and personal support to individuals as they let go of religious beliefs. Now, my friends, the very fact that there is a market for these kind of organizations tells you that there's an apostasy taking place. Many former pastors are joining up with this kind of thing. Also, we have to look at the weakened view of the Bible and the effect that that has on the Bible reading habits of some people. Now, I know I'm about to step on some toes, probably. And if I'm about to step on some toes, I apologize in advance, but I must speak the truth of the Lord here. Can I do that? Fact is, the shack is full of problems. You know, it's a book that is so incredibly popular, and it is inspirational when you read it, but it's wrong. We've got bookstores lining up to sell this book, and I don't blame them. I know it's making them a lot of money, but just look at some of the problems. Uh, a book, by the way, endorsed by Eugene Peterson, who, uh, you know, uh, put together the Message Bible. He said that uh, it has the potential to do for our generation what John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress did for his. I don't think so. I don't think so. The book communicates that traditional Christian teaching and Sunday prayers and hymns and a traditional approach to Christianity are all wrong. Uh, the Trinity, you know, the Father is a large, beaming African-American woman. Jesus is a Middle Eastern, dressed like a laborer, complete with two belt and gloves, and the Holy Spirit is named Sar Sarayu, a small, distinctively Asian woman. That's tritheism. That's not Trinitarianism. This is putting the Trinity into three people. That is heresy. William Young, the author, argues that we should forget your, our preconceived notions about God, forget your seminary training, that God appears to us in whatever form 
we personally need. Christianity, he says, has to be revised in order to be understood. How dare any human being say that Christianity, which is based upon revelation from God Almighty, say that Christianity must be revised. Boy, I hesitate to think about William Young at the judgment when God says, what's this about a revision? You know, what's going on there? Uh, personal experience is supreme in this book. It communicates that personal experience trumps revelation. If you've got problems, you don't go to the Bible, you go to your experience, and experience is used uh, to interpret the Bible instead of the Bible being used to interpret Scripture. As for sin, Papa, or the Father, says this, I am not who you think I am. I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It is not my purpose to punish it. It's my joy to cure it. Well, I agree that God's carrying it, but God does punish sin. In fact, unbelievers will be punished for all eternity in a politically incorrect place that we call hell, okay? <laughs> There's a false view of incarnation here. Listen to this. Instead of Jesus indwelling or coming in the flesh, we've got the entire Trinity coming. When we three spoke ourselves into human existence as the Son of God, we became fully human. We also chose to embrace all the limitations that this entailed. Even though we have always been present in this universe, we now became flesh and blood. And then in terms of salvation, Christ is just the best way to relate to the Father, not the only way. So I'm sorry, you know, the fact is, is that Christian bookstores should not be selling this book. It leads me to believe that there are landmines in Christian bookstores today, and innocent people walk in there thinking they're safe, but they step on a landmine and the whole thing blows up. You see, it's dangerous. That's why we need discernment, like at these conferences. Meanwhile, the word faith movement refuses to go away. It refuses to go away. Word faith leaders teach that humans are little gods, that we can name it and claim it and create our own reality, and that Jesus was born again in hell and that God must ask our permission to do certain things on earth. Now, their books are still being sold on Amazon.com, still being sold, BarnesandNoble.com. All their ministry websites are still se uh, selling the same books and the same tapes that have taught this kind of stuff. And this is heresy. Let me say it like it is. It is absolute heresy. It is a departure from the faith. And then there is Christian Wicca. Christian Wicca. We are witnessing this among our teens today, which involves a blending of witchcraft and Christianity. One young Christian Wiccan said this. It's a young teenage girl who said, I started studying the book Earth Power, which is by Witch Scott Cunningham, and started to dabble in some of its practices and a few others. I purchased the craft by Dorothy Morrison, and Wicca, a guide for the solitary practitioner by Cunningham, and found myself in a faith I could truly hold dear to my heart. How deceived. She did say that I did, however, feel somewhat empty still. Jesus has been a part of my life for almost three years and has helped me become who I am today. I started looking into Christian Wicca then. Then she says, I follow the Wiccan read. That's their ethical principle that says you shouldn't harm anybody but also take the Ten Commandments to heart greatly. You shall not hold any gods before me. This is one that people really don't get when it comes to my beliefs. I believe that there is only one true God and that all other gods are part of the one. The Christian Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is also somewhat a reflection of this. I view it as God, goddess, or the feminine quality of God, and Jesus as all still being part of one being. You know, so that's a big problem among our teens today. And then, as if that wasn't enough, we've got Chrislam making its way into our midst, which says that Christianity and Islam are compatible, that both the Bible and the Quran are holy texts, that there are similar teachings between the two on morals and ethics, and that we worship the same God. You know, they'll say that we both worship the God of Abraham, and therefore we worship the same God. Now, my friends, is that true? Absolutely not. Uh, the, the Quran and Muslims will tell you that there is no such thing as the Trinity, that that's heresy, and that Jesus is absolutely not God. How dare anyone claim that anyone is Allah's equal? You see, so this is just a bunch of linguistic nonsense trying to argue that Christianity and Islam are compatible. They absolutely are not compatible. And then we've got Christian psychics. 
Uh, you know, when Sylvia Brown does television shows today, she often refers to God and Christ and the Holy Spirit on TV. She does all by the grace of God. She says at her website, it says, the Holy Spirit works through Sylvia to emanate God's love, grace, and blessings. And it goes on to talk about how that when she communicates with dead people, it's the Holy Spirit that is empowering her to do that. Now, who is it really? It is the unholy spirit, you see. Now, she claims to be on a mission for God. Her primary goal is to show that the soul survives death, but it becomes very clear when she says both Father God and Mother God are infinitely loving with virtually no wrath. You see, that's the common pagan view of who God is in the world. Now, these days, as a result of her, you can now pick up these tabloids on the weekend that have classified ads that advertise Christian psychics. For a mere $200 an hour, you can have a Christian psychic by the power of the Holy Spirit get in contact with your dead loved ones. My friends, it should never be. Psychic phenomena is blasphemy. It is a heinous sin against our true and holy God. She says that to, to enable her to complete her mission, God has given her a psychic ability and is unmatched by anyone, which is evident to all who have seen her work on television shows. If you want to see that statement debunked, buy my book on ghosts and psychics. I thoroughly debunk that claim. Now, of great concern to me is the plummet of modern Christianity into mysticism. Uh, it's a large movement, this emerging church movement, and it's too broad for me to discuss in detail. But, uh, you know, there are some things in the movement that are okay, like using media and new forms of music and skits and presentations. That kind of stuff is just fine. But you know what? When you get into the mystical, like one wing of the emerging church is done, that's where the danger comes. D.A. Carson, who is a good scholar who wrote a book, uh, Becoming Conversant, Conversant with the Emerging Church, says that for almost everyone within the movement, there is an emphasis on feeling and affections over against linear thought and rationality, on experience over against the truth. And then Dan, Dan Kimball, who is uh, part, him, part of the Emerging Church himself, says that the basis of learning have shifted from logic and rational systematic thought to the realm of experience. People increasingly long for the mystical and the spiritual rather than the evidential and facts-based faith. In, order, in other words, we use experience, not the Bible. We don't use the objective word of God. We base everything on experience. Now, my friend, uh, Pastor Gary Gilley, noted the backward reasoning. He said, the old paradigm taught that if you had the right teaching, you will experience God. The new paradigm says that if you experience God, you will have the right teaching. So what we're seeing today in the emerging church is Christians practicing deep breathing and proper posture, yoga, chanting like Benedictine monks, and the use of mantras or holy words to go into a deep state of meditation. We've got contemplative prayer, which I'll talk about in a moment. And all of this is allegedly yielding a richer, more authentic spiritual experience for Christians. Now, my friends, Richard Foster, whose books are used in every major evangelical seminary today says that the goal is union with God. Bonaventure, a follower of St. Francis, says that our final goal is union with God, which is the pure relationship where we see nothing. When you have union with God, you're not aware of the table or the podium or the computer or the chair or the floor or anything else. You've got cosmic consciousness where you are one with God. That's what they're talking about here. Thomas Keating, another person who's very famous in the movement, says that contemplative prayer is the opening of mind and heart, our whole being to God, the ultimate mystery beyond thoughts, words, and emotions. He depersonalizes God to the nameless ultimate mystery instead of Abba Father, to whom we can turn. Reason is not enough. Foster says the Holy Spirit will not barge in if you're using merely reason. He says it's only when we are willing to abandon our very limited human modes of thoughts and concepts and open a welcoming space that the Spirit will begin to operate in us at this divine level. My friends, what happens when you let go of your mind? Anything goes. Anything goes. And when you look at the religious landscape today, that's what we're seeing. Anything goes today. And it's all based upon the subjective mysticism. Foster says that when we center or meditate, we practice leaving our human thoughts and reason behind and attending to the divine, to the spirit, you see. 
Uh, as for mantras, John Main is very popular here. He says that we should breathe calmly and regularly, silently, interiorly, begin to say a single word. We recommend the prayer phrase, Maranatha. Maranatha, Maranatha, you know, that kind of stuff. Recite it as four syllables of equal length. Listen to it as you say it, gently but continuously. Do not think or imagine anything. Keep returning to simply saying the word. Brennan Manning, who just passed away, said the same thing. Choose a single sacred word and repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly and often. Enter into the great silence of God, and alone in that silence the noise within will subside and the voice of love will be heard. My friends, what is this? This is Christian Hinduism. This is a Christian Hindu hybrid. This has no part in true Christianity. I'm all for meditating on scripture, friends, but not this kind of stuff where you let go of your consciousness and let subjectivism take over. Mysticism in the place of the objective word of God is a fast track to apostasy, amen? Now there's a new kind of Christian on the horizon here. I'm talking about Brian McLaren. Some of you have heard of him. He's one of the top evangelical leaders in the world. In fact, Time Magazine says that he is one of the 25 most influential evangelicals in the world. Phyllis Tickle, editor at Publishers Weekly, says that he is the Martin Luther for the 21st century. He received the Award of Merit from Christianity Astray Magazine, that is to say, Christianity Today Magazine, <laughs> back in 2002, for his new kind of Christian. Now here's what he says. Certainty is overrated. Uh, history teaches that a lot of people thought they were certain and we found out they weren't certain. Uh, much is ambiguous. We just can't know about certain things today, he says. We can't know about biblical inerrancy. Maybe it's not true. We don't know about divine sovereignty. You know, too many bad things happen in the world. Uh, eternal punishment, nah. Exclusive religious claims, no. Any doctrinal distinctive, mm-mm, get rid of that. Any teaching that would exclude other religions is tossed out the back door. Now this is an evangelical, he quote marks, okay, he claims to be. He's not sure about anything. Listen to what he says here. If I seem to show too little respect for your opinions or thought, be assured that I have equal doubts about my own and I don't mind if you think I'm wrong. I'm sure I am wrong about many things, although I'm not sure exactly which things I'm wrong about. <laughs> I'm even sure I'm wrong about what I think I'm right about, in at least some cases. So wherever you think I'm wrong, you could be right. <laughs> Contrast that with the biblical prophets. What did they say? Thus saith the Lord. They were very clear. There was no uncertainty. But these modern prophets in the emerging church movement, they don't know where they came from and they don't know where they're going. McLaren writes, because knowledge is a luxury beyond our means, faith is the best we can hope for. He urges, drop any affair you may have with certainty. Is this logical? You know, I like to think logically. He amounts to saying this, I am quite certain that you should drop any affair you may have with certainty. <laughs> or it might go this way, I am certain that there can be no certainty. <laughs> or it might go like this. We have the luxury of knowing that we can't have the luxury of knowing. <laughs> or you might look at it this way. There are good reasons for believing. There are no good reasons for what we believe. You see, as Spock would say, this is highly illogical. <laughs> have you ever heard of a self-defeating argument? The guy's blowing his head off and he doesn't even know it. He's too uncertain to know that he's in danger. Meanwhile, the guy goes on to deny the Bible. He no longer believes the Bible is the word of God. Rather, the Bible errantly contains the word of God. He says, it bothers me to use exclusive and Jesus in the same sentence. Maybe God's plan is an opt-out plan, not an opt-in plan. If you wanna stay out of the party, you can, otherwise you're saved whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Hare Krishna or anything else. You see, that is absolutely fallacious. And it gets worse, my friends. Jesus' death on the cross is considered nothing less than cosmic child abuse on the part of the Father. He agrees with Alan Jones, and just listen to what Jones says here. The church's fixation on the death of Jesus as a universal saving act must end, and the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. 
Why? Because of the vindictive God behind it. He goes on to say, implicit in the cross is the idea that Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. Penal substitution was the name of this vile doctrine. You want to know my response when I first read that? Here it is. (laughs) You want to talk about my Jesus? You want to talk about my Jesus who died for my sins at the cross? My friends, them's fighting words. Them's fighting words. And I don't care who you are, I'll stand against you with everything that is in me. I will tell you this, we don't need a new kind of Christian. We need a Bible-believing, obedient to God, walk with Jesus, depend on the Spirit, fearless in the face of opposition kind of Christian. That's the kind of Christians we have here today. We don't need a new kind of Christian. What we need is a Jesus-centered, Jesus-exalting, tell the whole world about Jesus because he is the only way kind of Christian. These guys are as lost as a goose, and the deception is enormous out there. It gets even worse, my friends, because another statistic we have is that many of these Christians and churches today are joining up with cults. Did you know that 25% of people who join the cults come out of an evangelical Bible-believing Christian? 25%. And another 40% come from one of the larger liberal denominations. I believe that Satan is a master niche marketer. He comes up with something for everyone in order to draw people away from the truth. And uh, if you like health and wealth, maybe the prosperity of gospel is for you. If you like sensuality and sex, the children of God are for you. If you like denial of pain and death, Christian science is for you. You want personal empowerment? Well, maybe the I am movement in the new age is, is for you. Contact with the dead? Check out spiritism. Self-gratification, Satanism is your ticket. Human divinity, well, there's lots of options there. You know, Mormons would be one choice. Whatever it is, Satan has come up with these master plans for drawing people, different segments of our population, away from the truth of Scripture. And he's had thousands of years of experience in doing it. No wonder Scripture tells us to beware of Satan's schemes. For example, 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that we should not let Satan outwit us, for we are not aware of his schemes. Well, at conferences like this, we uncover his schemes, you see? And it's very beneficial for us to hear this. Now then, what I want to do is to shift our attention to focus on some of the statistics that show that the church is under siege today and that apostasy is on a massive level. Uh, For example, uh, George Barna did a survey which was engineered to help understand how many people have a biblical worldview. And a biblical worldview is defined as believing that there is absolute moral truth, that the Bible is totally accurate, that Satan is a real being and not just an idea, that a person cannot earn their way to salvation by good works, Jesus lived a sinless life, and God is all-knowing and all-powerful as the Creator. And in the research, if you believed all those things, then you had a biblical worldview. Among born-again Christians, less than one out of every five, that's 19%, have such, such an outlook on life. Less than half of the born-again adults, 46%, believe in absolute moral truth. Only 79% of born-again adults believe the Bible is accurate in its teachings. A minority of born-again adults, 40%, believe Satan is a real being. Only 47% of born-again adults strongly reject earning salvation through good deeds. Less than two-thirds of born-again adults, 62%, believe Jesus Christ lived a sinless life while he was on the earth. And in terms of spiritual commitment, Barna says that among those who believe they are Christians, only one-fifth say they live in a way that makes them completely dependent upon God. And surprisingly, only one-fifth claim that the most important decision they ever made was to trust in Jesus for salvation. I don't know about you, but that's got to be number one, doesn't it? Doesn't that got to be number one? One One-sixth say they are totally committed to engaging in personal spiritual development. It's not just Barna, but Gallup just very recently had a poll It says that even though it might seem like Americans are as pious as ever, uh, 77% say religion is losing its influence in the United States. And I have to hang my head and moan, my friends, because it gets worse among our teenagers and among our youth. Over half of once active evangelical teens are spiritually disengaged by their 20s. Over three-fourths of them are not as spiritually active as they were with teens. 
uh, when they were teens. And then most attended church regularly during elementary school. Only half attended regularly during high school, and only one out of ten went to church while they were in college. Now, here's the thing. When they do go to college, they are more likely not to believe that the accounts in the Bible are true. That's what the polls indicate. When teens go to college, they are more likely to doubt the Bible because it was written by men, allegedly. When they go to college, they are more likely to doubt the Bible because it was not translated correctly. That's the claim. When teens go to college, they are more likely to justify abortion, defend premarital sex, be tolerant of gay marriage, and to believe in evolution instead of creation. As for the top 10 reasons that they choose not to go to church, 12% say that the church service is boring. 12% say the church is too legalistic. 11% say there's hypocrisy. 10% say the church is too political. 9% say there's too many self-righteous people. 7% say it's too far from home. 6% say it's not relevant to personal growth. 6% God say that God's not going to send people to hell anyway, so why bother? 5% say the Bible is not relevant to the way that we live. 5% say you couldn't, they couldn't find a preferred church in their area. You know what they left out? Satan's activity behind the scenes to ensure that our next generation will stay away from the Christ of the Bible. Satan is a master of deception, and the deception is global in nature. Now, when did their doubts begin? Well, 33% say they learned in school things that caused them to doubt God. 60% say that they were taught evolution in high school. Uh, 80% say their college professors had an ungodly influence on them. It's in that context that I want to read you something that Martin Luther said. I am much afraid that the universities will prove to be the great gates to hell unless they diligently labor to explain the Holy Scriptures and to engrave them upon the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution where men are not unceasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. Words for the wise, my friends. Again, I must say that this description of this statistically significant apostasy taken in conjunction with other signs of the times, shows that we are living in the season of the Lord's return. And I've just given you the tip of the iceberg. I, I, I'm not kidding when I tell you I could keep you to midnight, giving you examples about all this, but this is where we are. And what I want to do is not just leave a, a, a negative note here. I want to close on an exhortational note because I don't want to see any of us fall astray. Let me just tell you a story about a farmer who ran into financial difficulty. Because he ran into financial difficulty, he started to mix some sawdust in with the oats that he fed to the mule. I'm not sure if the mule noticed much of a difference at first. It was only about 10% sawdust. But as time continued, the farmer continued to have a financial struggle. So he put ever-increasing amounts of sawdust into the oats. Eventually it came to be about half and half. I'm sure the donkey began to think, these are terrible oats. Uh, in any event, as time passed, the farmer continued to have financial difficulties, and it came to a point where about 80% of the feed was just sawdust. And soon after that, the mule fell over dead. My friends, God desires us to feed on the pure oats of his word. Our souls cannot survive on spiritual sawdust. Satan, however, seeks to contaminate the oats with sawdust. He knows that if we partake a little spiritual sawdust, it's a slippery slope into spiritual famine. And I dare say it's happening all over the world today. We've got multitudes sliding down the hill into absolute apostasy because of this spiritual sawdust. No wonder Paul wrote to Timothy saying, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. We must never give up, my friends. We must never give up. I will say it again. We must never give up. <laughs> no matter what we face, we must stand strong in the Word of God. Amen? Amen? I would encourage each one of us to engage in some self-examination to make sure that we're in the faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and test yourselves, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. And I would exhort you to watch for Danger signals. For example, have you ever experienced a loss of appetite for God's word? 
There's no more appetite for the pure milk of the word. You see, it's a dangerous thing to have happen because faith comes from hearing the word of God. And if you spend time outside of God's word, your faith weakens. And you're an easy victim for, for Satan, falling prey to Satan, who will draw you into complete apostasy. Another dangerous signal, a lack of regard for God's truth. You know, God's truth has a sanctifying effect on our lives. And if you stay away from God's word, you will not only fall into doctrinal apostasy, but moral apostasy as well. And I hate to tell, tell you, friends, but it's happening to Christians everywhere. One example would be the multitude of Christians who have fallen into to deep pornography. And this is even pastors. The polls indicate that there are even pastors who this past week have looked at internet pornography. It should never be. This is moral apostasy, which goes along with doctrinal apostasy. Yet another danger signal, a loss of desire for prayer and spending time with God. We ought to be praying without ceasing, but a lack of prayer is an obvious step in the direction of apostasy. Another danger signal, a loss of desire to assemble with the saints. You see, the early Christians met often with glad and generous hearts, but to step away from fellowship is to step toward apostasy. It should never, ever happen. Uh, Another signal, a lack of involvement in God's work. God desires us to serve others by our special gifts, but apostates are lethargic. Now, my friends, this is all why I tell you to never, ever give up. I don't want to see any of this happen to anybody that attends a lamb and lion conference. Amen? Amen. We must stay strong in the word of God. And so my closing is this. this Loss of love for others is another one. Uh, My closing is simply this. Be sober-minded and be watchful and be firm in your faith. It's a simple statement, but it says it all, doesn't it? Be sober-minded, be watchful, and be firm in your faith. And I might add, never give up. Fight the good fight of the faith and never give up. Contend for the faith that were once for all delivered to the saints and never give up. That is what I desire for every person here. And I want to just leave a bit of good news with you. Soon, you and I will be in the AFZ. The AFZ. That's the apostasy free free zone. You see. That's right. One day, you and I will live in the New Jerusalem, the eternal city of God, which will come down from heaven onto a new earth. We will have resurrected bodies, and we will live in a resurrected universe. And the word apostasy will not even be in the dictionary. It will be an awesome thing. And meanwhile, until that happens, my friends, may the joy of the Lord be your strength. Maranatha. God bless you.